last couple days, really haven't been sure what to do with the channel. And then Stan Lee died, and I was like, nobody's going to want to care. Um, so I just didn't, I couldn't think of anything else to do. So, yeah, a couple days off, I guess. But, uh, yeah, like I explained, as far as I'm concerned, uh, Congress Gate is a hashtag. It's very clear what the average person who uses that hashtag wants. So, while I consider myself very much a supporter of the original things that, that brought people together under that hashtag, um, I don't feel the need to, like, represent it anymore. So... Uh, in, in the spirit of that, this video is going to be about why I think one of the core tenets of Comicsgate is misguided. And this is something that I've kind of evolved on. This is something that uh, the more I think about it, the more I've changed my mind on it. Because in the past, I've talked about how politics kind of uh, ruin a story. That, that it takes you out of the story, that it just adds an unnecessary uh, way to, to distract you, that it just feels like that... The author is trying to propagandize you. And so just from a purely creative standpoint, inserting unnecessary politics into a story uh, is really a bad idea just from, I think, a pure storytelling point of view. Um, not to mention that when you have these hypothetically neutral, broad-based, uh, mass-appeal characters like Spider-Man and Superman and Batman and, and all these big-time superhero characters that are supposed to be for everybody, that are supposed to represent universal values of justice and honor and self-sacrifice and things like that, and then they get co-opted to mean an exclusively left-wing idea, or hypothetically an exclusively right-wing idea, even though off the top of my head I can't think of any superheroes that really do that. But when you when you do that, you, you cheapen what the character actually stands for in favor of just whatever your personal bugaboo is. Uh, however, in the past, I have also expressed support for Alt-Hero, and it's not so much for the comic itself, which you can judge on its own merits, obviously. Um, I think it's better than people are giving it credit for, but I understand it's not for everybody. But I've talked about how there needs to be more representation of a wider ideas in pop culture. So having these, like, totally neutral adventure stories being told, um, which is what Comicsgate says it wants, I don't really see how that is going to accomplish anything. Like, right now, Dynamite Entertainment just wrapped up a Charlie's Angels arc, you know, because Dynamite, they do mostly licensed comics. And in, it was written by Super SJW John Lehman. But the thing is, it was actually really entertaining. It really didn't have a lot of politics in it, except for maybe, arguably, the end. Just a really entertaining series. And that kind of stuff... It's all through American comics. You, you don't really have to look that hard to find just completely neutral adventure stories. Um, and so when I look at things like, like Jawbreakers and Cyberfrog and the way that people are flocking to them, on the one hand, uh, Jawbreakers, it, it looks like John Malin's best art ever. I've seen, you know, I've read John Malin on cable, I've read him on some other stuff, and it looks like John Malin really went above and beyond for Jawbreakers. And same with Cyberfrog. Like you compare the preview pages of Cyberfrog that Ethan has shown on his Twitter, and you compare that to his work on Green Lantern. Yeah, it's very obvious that when Ethan Merzgaver talks about him trying to make Cyberfrog as just really good as he can, that he really means it, and he's really taking that to its next level. So if, if we're just talking about terms of like just pure technical proficiency, that we need them to be better than the current mainstream uh, industry is, I mean, that's a fair point, but... If we're trying to actually deny the SJWs more than they already have, um, I'm not sure that that kind of thing is all that people who consider themselves anti-SJWs in media, that they need to um, support. One thing that SJWs, whenever we bring up politics on Twitter, one thing that SJWs really like to bring up in, in relation to comics is that, well, I've read comics by right-wing creators as well, and I didn't have a problem with those. Which, it's like, how many right-wing creators in comics that wrote explicitly right-wing messages into their comics do you really know about? Like, Chuck Dixon is a Republican, but I'll admit I'm not like a Chuck Dixon super fan. I've really only read some of this stuff, but it seems to me that for the most part, his stuff is pretty neutral. And he's even talked about how a lot of times he's been forced by circumstance to write stuff they didn't agree with. And then you contrast that to, like, left-wing creators... Like, a lot of those UK left-winger types, they are very, very open about putting in progressive left-wing ideas in their comics. Um, one creator that a lot of current Marvel creators 
uh, always say that they are really heavily inspired by is Warren Ellis. Uh, Warren Ellis, the writer of Planetary and The Authority and Iron Man Extremis and a bunch of other stuff, he's a really good writer. There's no doubt about that. You read any of his stuff, it's very deep, it's very entertaining, but it's very difficult to find Warren Ellis written comics that don't have left-wing ideas in them. Some of them are worse about it than others, but you read something like uh, his run on Thunderbolts with Mike Diodato, which is pretty much just anti-Bush all the time, to look at somebody like Warren Ellis, who's a legitimately really good writer, and then you look at the themes he's incorporated into his comics, um, and it's not hard to see why so many much less accomplished creators in Marvel, why they're so open about putting these kinds of ideas into their own stories, because... They think they basically trying to emulate Warren Ellis and people like Warren Ellis and a lot of other like UK left wingers like Alan Moore and Grant Morrison and Mark Millar and things like that. Although Mark Millar is kind of weird about his politics. But anyway, so you had these left wing creators and they're openly left wing and they paved the way for other less good but no less strident left wing creators to keep telling those kinds of stories because now there's it's been proven that the audience will will buy it even when there's that left-wing bias. Now contrast that with the Republican creators that I'm aware of. Now, like I said, most of them, most of the time, there's really very little like openly conservative, openly right-wing, even just simply anti-far-left ideas. You'll see them occasionally, but it's very rare. And I will point you to one that I'm aware of that's actually a very illustrative example, I think, of a, of a lot of the problems. Fables is a DC Vertigo title. It went for 150 issues. If you look at pretty much any, like, top 25 graphic novels of all time, there's about a 50-50 chance that Fables will be on it. So even though it's DC Vertigo, I would say it's a mainstream thing. Uh, it's about a bunch of fairy tale characters living in the real world, but unlike that stupid show Once Upon a Time, these are not the Disney versions of the characters. These are the original grim fairy tale versions of the characters. So there's lots of sex, there's lots of violence, there's lots of nudity. I mean, it was written by Bill Willingham, and Bill Willingham is one of the few openly Republican creators in comics. Or at least, to be fair, this was a couple years ago. I don't know if he's changed his, his politics since then. But at least a couple years ago, he was writing articles for Breitbart, back before it became the all-Trump, all-the-time website. In Fables, the second volume, there is a moment where uh, one of the main characters, Snow White, um, she gets date raped, and as a result of that, she gets pregnant. And the the fairy tale doctor tells her, "So, uh, when do you want to schedule the abortion?" And Snow White, point blank, with no punches pulled at all, says, "Abortion? No, I'm not a coward like those normal human women. This is my responsibility, and I'll bear it." A shockingly uh, anti-abortion screed. And it really kind of sur really surprised me when I saw it. I was like, I've never seen anything that that's, that's just that open about it. Now, this example is kind of weird because on the one hand, it absolutely fulfills what I was talking about at the beginning of this video, that it took me out of the story. It broke the flow of me reading it just because of not only how shocking it was, but it's like when you think about what she actually said, she seems to very strongly say that people that consider getting an abortion are cowards and the implications of that it's like, it makes you think, but not necessarily in a, in a way that the author intended. Interestingly, though, later on, Willingham kind of walks that back. He reveals that basically all of the fairy tale women that get pregnant in the real world end up dying. It's really unclear if he always intended that to be the case or not. Because after he gets revealed, it ends up becoming a fairly important plot point, but it takes probably till about halfway through the series or more until that gets revealed. Up until that point, there's no indication that that was true. So I don't really, I don't personally know if he intended that to be the case, that getting pregnant kills you or not. But he nevertheless, he, he kind of walked it back from that initial impression. And I can't tell exactly why he did that. And I'm not, I'm not going to speculate on why. But how often, regardless of why he did it, because maybe he always intended to do it. How often do you see left-wingers walking back the kind of crazy stuff they do in their own comics? right? Like Usually you see what Chelsea Kane does, at least in my experience, which is that in her Mockingbird series, it's a dumb series, people don't like it, the readers accuse her of inserting this feminist agenda, 
into the comics and what does she and the artists of the series do, they make that very explicit with the very last cover where she's wearing the infamous feminist agenda shirt. That's usually what I see, is people either doubling down or being reined in only by their editor, which with DC Vertigo, I wouldn't have thought that the editor would care that much about the actual content, more so the technical element of the writing. But it seems to me that with in right-wing circles, or at least in anti-far-left circles, so people that are on the left but still don't like what the far left is doing, you always see it get walked back, or you see it that the corporation that they work for is more or less forced to apologize. And why is that? I think there's a lot of reasons for that, and I don't think that, you know, I, I'm not going to pretend to explain the entire thing, but I think one of the reasons for that is just simply that the unabashedness with which a lot of more famous left-wing progressive types have inserted their messages into these stories, like the idea of Green Arrow being a, a left-winger that really doesn't predate Denny O'Neill's run on the character, Denny O'Neill working on it. Likewise, Batman being stridently anti-gun and anti-killing doesn't predate Denny O'Neill working on him. So, like, you have this very left-wing guy, Denny O'Neill, he inserts these left-wing ideas into it, and those become canonical. Meanwhile, you know, Hawkman became kind of canonically conservative, but if you read the modern Hawkman series, there's really none of that in there. But there's absolutely a lot of, you know, progressive stuff in the current Green Arrow series. So, these these left-wingers being unabashed in their worldview and putting that worldview into their stories, and then that influencing further generations of writers to carry on that story and take it even farther, that seems to be a recurring theme, and it's just something that doesn't happen on the right and on anti-progressive circles. And I think that that has very much contributed to what we perceive nowadays as being this SJW infestation of comics, and not just of comics, of video games, of increasingly moving TVs, of like pretty much every form of mass entertainment. It's difficult to get away from this progressive stuff. Even Japanese media, which we always thought would be immune to that, is starting to signal that they're going to start bowing to the SJW mindset. So clearly, the SJWs are doing something right. Like, we like to pretend that they're just a bunch of weak, emotionally immature, triggered snowflakes, but they're clearly doing something right. And I think that we need to look at what they're doing to emulate it more. And I think being unabashed in our worldview and being unabashed in our political biases is one of those things because that paves the way for people that are are behind you to also follow in those footsteps. Now, that doesn't mean that I think cyber frog or jawbreakers or whatever are like failures because they they apparently don't do this in fact you could even argue that by being explicitly non-political that they are still going after uh the sjw mindset that everything must necessarily include politics but the problem is is that if you argue that you're still kind of agreeing that the non-political element of cyber frog and jawbreakers is still a political element um, so a key thing to argue. So there may be a lot to that. Well done stories that are just simply straight up adventure stories and it takes on the SJW idea that you have to have politics and everything. I think there's something to that. But the SJWs, they didn't get to be successful by moderating themselves. Like the only reason they moderated themselves was because their editors more or less reined them in. They said, no, you cannot include this really crazy stuff in a Spider-Man comic. Bendis has talked about how he was his editors had to tell him not to do stuff all the time on Ultimate Spider-Man. But yeah, they only moderated themselves to the extent that they could get away with it. And there are times, I'm sure, when you can find uh, people that did self-moderate themselves. Garth Ennis talked about how when he wrote Welcome Back Frank that he, he said that he didn't want to make it some kind of meditation on violence and vigilantism in America, that he just wanted it to be about Punisher shooting gangsters. And Garth Ennis is not somebody who's afraid to put political themes into his comics. He's another you know, left-wing uh, UK type. Um, so there is room for that. But I, th I think that you have to look at how the SJWs got where they are and have to figure out how can we uh, do the same thing to get them out, essentially. And I think that one of the ways to do that is to support comics that openly take on the SJW mentality. I have seen a few other comics that I'm aware of. Uh, one, it was already, it's Indiegogo is already over, but Jim Helis' Blue Mamba is about a lesbian assassin that, at least in the first issue, 
ends up taking on some LGBTQ activists. And the idea is that these activist types are ginning up problems and ginning up drama and are actually hurting the LGBT community where it didn't need to be hurt before. Um, so that's kind of an uh, interesting take on it. That's, you know, somebody... I, I don't really know Jim Healis' politics, but I'm guessing he's probably center-left and he's taking on the far left. So that's something. Uh, another one is uh, Martina Marcota's Lady Alchemy, which is a semi-autobiographical graphic novel about her experiences being forced out by feminists from the burlesque scene. Right, so there's another one that is taking on the, the actual negative effects of this progressive idea. One I saw on Indiegogo was called The Agenda, Superheroes with a Purpose. And it's from writer James Hudnall, who's written on Superman, and he's written on uh, a couple other things uh, over the years. He's actually been in comics since like the late 80s, so he's been around a long time. Um, a lot of indie stuff. And he wrote uh, this agenda thing, this, this comic agenda, uh, in conjunction with this website called The Freedom Forge, which Mike Miller is associated with. But, uh, once again, that's about an explicitly sort of right-wing idea taking on basically the globalists. Um, and I'm sure that there's others, and I'm willing to hear what suggestions that you have that kind of look at this. But I think that for those of us that are trying to call out and look at the SDWs that are in so many forms of entertainment now and so many forms and politics and all this stuff, I think we have to look at what they're doing. And, I, and the one thing I keep seeing that they're doing is that they are unabashed and they are proud of the narrative that they've crafted them for themselves and they put that into everything. And on the right, all I keep seeing is people moderating it, people trying to pretend it isn't what it is, people trying to play by the rules on the left that they, that they set by you know virtue of them having this narrative. And I don't see a whole lot of pushback against the philosophy of the left itself. Um, more so just permutations of essentially culturally left-wing ideas that are still free of the hard left progressive politics. So it's not that those things don't have their place. It's just that I think that there needs to be more of a uh, more of a market for these explicitly political things because if we show that there's a market for that, then it might start to break the hegemony that progressives seem to have in so many of these major media institutions. So I'm going to wrap this video up. Um, first video in a while since the uh, unpleasantness last week. Um, tell me what you think. Tell me how you uh, feel about this. Give me any suggestions that I missed. Like, comment, subscribe. In any case, this is Unring Chevron signing off.